I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to our webinar this afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Kirk with the Canadian Apparel Federation, and I'm uh, very happy to uh, uh, welcome Havidis Safarian from the RAP uh, program to discuss uh, trends in social compliance. Uh, I'd like to give one or two minutes of uh, housekeeping as people uh, join the webinar, and then uh, I'll turn the floor over to Clay Hickson from RAP to do a quick introduction. So uh, for most people on the line, you'll be familiar with the GoToWebinar system, uh, usually in the top right-hand uh, corner of your uh, screen, there will be a control panel with a question icon. Uh, so you can simply ask a quick question if you have it. I'd recommend that as the presentation is made, if a question occurs to you, ask the question. It'll go into our system and we'll try to answer it at the end. If for any reason we don't have time to get to your question, don't worry. It's uh, compiled and sent uh, to the presenter immediately after we wrap up. So it's a uh, quite a seamless system, ask the questions as they come up, and if for any reason they don't get answered, uh, they'll be answered offline afterwards. Uh, secondly, uh, as uh, most of you will know, we will be recording this session, and the recording will be available within you know, about 24 hours. Uh, you'll get an automatic email in terms of uh, signing on. So if you have to leave early or if you don't want to, you know, take a lot of notes, don't worry, you'll get the, uh, the webinar recording link uh, by tomorrow. So the bottom line is uh, sit back, uh, listen, uh, watch the screen, and as I said, a full recording will come back to you tomorrow. So uh, without any further ado, I'll turn the floor over to Clay Hickson from RAP and he'll, he'll introduce our speaker today. Hello everyone and thanks Bob. We certainly appreciate the Canadian Apparel Federation's uh, being a host for this webinar and giving us the opportunity to share some of our perspectives about social compliance in this highly uncertain era. It, and we also appreciate the um, Apparel Textile Sourcing Canada show which is sponsoring this event and we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of, of this webinar. Now I'd like to formally introduce Avadis Safarian. He joined RAP all the way back in 2004 but in uh, 2012 stepped up and became RAP's CEO, President and CEO, and he has had many years of involvement in the social compliance and ethical manufacturing space and regularly participates in a number of different industry events and speaking around the world at conferences, trade shows, etc. on important issues like those that we'll be talking about here today. And so, without further introduction, I'd like to turn the time over to Avadis. Well, thank you very much, Clay, and I'd like to echo uh, and add my own thanks to Bob and the CAF for hosting this. Um, we've uh, had the pleasure of working with Bob and the Canadian Apparel Federation a time or two before, and we certainly enjoyed the partnership. I have always maintained that one of the more important functions that these uh, trade associations and industry bodies uh, can and ought to play is in the form of providing uh, a forum for education of members, and this is a great example of such an event. So we're going to talk about trends in social compliance, uh, we've subtitled it Perspectives from RAP. Uh, thanks to Clay's kind introduction, you have um, at least some sense of uh, why uh, you know my perspective should uh, uh, be relevant to this uh, topic. Um, I'd also like to spend just a minute at the beginning to introduce you to RAP to give you a fuller sense of why RAP's perspective on social compliance ought to be um, a credible one and one that hopefully will present valuable insights to, um, to folks. Um, as the topic suggests, we'll be talking about trends. So I'll spend some time discussing sort of broader trends that act as background to the specific trends that we want to discuss, which will include looking at trends in sourcing, more broadly speaking, and then of course in social compliance itself, uh, where I will also be discussing some current hot topics 
in addition to the broader trends that uh, we will be spending time on. Um, I'll also spend a few minutes just talking about best practices and also, again, from the point of view of trends, what are the trending best practices in the social compliance space before moving on to uh, the question and answer session, which, as Bob described, will be through uh, questions submitted if, uh, via the chat function. Obviously, you don't need to uh, wait till the end to uh, type in those, your questions. If they occur to you as I'm speaking, please feel free to type them in. But there will, of course, be time at the end to do that, too. Right, moving along to introduction to RAP, then. Uh, we are the world's largest independent certification program uh, in the social compliance uh, space focused on the SOM product sector. We do apparel, footwear, accessories, leather, um, you know, belts, bags, ties, you know, wearable stuff. Uh, we are a specialized certification program in the sense that there are uh, several peer organizations of ours that are social compliance focused in general, uh, but don't limit themselves to any one industry. We chose uh, long ago that we will concentrate our efforts on the apparel sector, on the sewn product sector uh, per se, uh, largely because it is unquestionably the most labor intensive uh, uh, sector out there and therefore the one with the highest impact on labor rights, human rights. And as far as social compliance trends go, it has unquestionably been true for the past decade and a half that whatever happens in the apparel sector is sort of the leading indicator of trends with regards to social compliance issues uh, with, with that field uh, at large. So we consider there is still so much work to be done in this sector that there's great value to be derived and certainly enabling us to provide more value to our stakeholders if we go deeper rather than simply try to go broader. So that's what we've done. We do inspect and certify factories all over the world. The W in the name stands for worldwide. Um, and so um, as you'll see shortly as I give you some numbers, uh, we have currently active factories in I believe 42 countries, uh, uh, pretty much anywhere that apparel is produced. Overall, the way we describe ourselves is as an objective nonprofit team of global social compliance experts and our mission is promoting safe, lawful, and humane ethical manufacturing around the world. And we do this through our certification program, chiefly, but also through education efforts. Uh, we consider it very much a part of our mission to be as informative to the broad stakeholder community as possible about social compliance issues at large. And this webinar is just one other example of uh, some ways in which we do this. So thank you once again to Bob and uh, also to our sponsors, the ATSC, for making this possible. So I said we are the leading independent certification program out there in this sector, and I want to back that up with some figures and some numbers for you. I've put up our top 10 countries for 2016 for you to see uh, where the factories are coming from, and you can see the number in that third column there is the number of factories that registered for our certification program. No real surprises there in the top 10. It kind of closely tracks the biggest apparel exporters, and certainly when you compare it to Otexa data with regards to imports into North America, especially the United States, you'll see that it lines up pretty much exactly along those figures. Um, last year, we received over 2,600 applications, um, and as of this point in time, mid-2017, there are a little over 2,300 facilities employing more than 2 million workers um, in RAP certified factories uh, all over the world, as I said, 42 countries. Uh, in addition, just to sort of give you a sense of our education part uh, in terms of our outreach, we have a weekly newsletter that goes out to over 8,300 global readers. And our website, which is available in four different languages, receives over 6,000 unique visitors per month. Uh, which, you know, for someone like me who had no real context of these numbers, I'm told is actually a very impressive figure. So I will certainly take the bearer of that news at his word. So with that kind of as background about my organization and hopefully uh, serving to provide context for why our perspective should matter, let's start talking about trends. And where to begin, uh, anywhere else besides this would not make sense, we live in very uncertain times. Uh, we are 
particularly challenged these days with regards to um, the lack of certainty around all kinds of issues, whether it comes to our markets as far as economic challenges go, and I'm sure I need not uh, revisit for those on this call who I take it are mostly in the North America space, the dire straits in which our retail markets currently find themselves. Um, we seem to be averaging a bankruptcy a week this year, and um, the projection right now for the sort of uh, brick and mortar space in particular is that 6,000 storefronts will shutter uh, in the U.S. alone before the end of the year. Um, so uncertainty in that market is uh, an understatement. And of course, uh, we are particularly blessed, if I may be so bold, uh, to uh, be living in extremely uncertain political times. Um, I am speaking to you right now from Brussels, but I was, uh, for the first three days of this week, in London, where they had themselves a little election last week that did not go the way they expected it to. Uh, very similar to the one they had before with regards to Brexit that did not go the way they expected it to. And of course, we had our own uh, fling with um, politically surprising results uh, not that long ago in the U.S. So the political climate is is really, uh, uh, to my recollection, uh, more uncertain than it's ever been, uh, especially with regards to the developed world. Uh, I think we're um, accustomed, I suppose, I should say, or you know, arrogant enough to think that it's not unusual to see that in, in the third world, but uh, we have long prided ourselves that that kind of stuff doesn't happen in the West, and yet here it is happening in the West. So very much a uh, uncertain environment overall, uh, politically and economically. And layer on top of this, uh, a another sort of modern reality, which is that this uncertain world is a world with 24-7 access to communication. Uh, we are truly blessed in this regard, not being sarcastic this time, to be living in a world where communication has never been easier. Um, and, and what that has meant, uh, uh, you know, all the positives of it aside, including the fact that I can sit in Brussels and have a webinar with folks from all over the world joining at different time zones and do it fairly seamlessly, is that um, uh, we also have now the sort of flip side of the sword, which is uh, that bad news can travel a lot faster as well, uh, exposing us to a lot more risk, certainly reputational risk, particularly with the ubiquity of social media. Uh, we are truly in a world that is watching, watching constantly. Uh, and by that, I do not mean the traditional media outlets, New York Times, the BBC, CNN, Wall Street Journal. You know, These we know, and they continue to do their job, and they do it well, and they're obviously getting better at it. They also have faster access to information and faster abilities to disseminate that information. But I am referring truly to that broader space of you know Twitter and Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram and YouTube and I don't even know half the platforms out there to be honest with you but uh, this social media universe uh, that is constantly on 24-7 completely accessible uh, from all over the world such that anyone anywhere with a smartphone can potentially be a reporter take a picture, take a video, upload it to one of these platforms, and before you know it goes viral, and you are now facing a massive PR headache. Uh, um, and so that risk, that reputational risk, uh, and sort of the uncertainty of whether or not that reputational risk is one that you will find yourself on the wrong side of is just simply higher than it has ever been. And this is having consequences, uh, not just sort of in the broad sense of always having to keep up with the Kardashians, but also with regards to what are we doing with uh, our sourcing decision making and the like. And the one you know, immediate impact is that it is resulting in constant change. Uh, I suspect we would be uh, in, in a fast churning sourcing environment even if we didn't have as much social media access, but I'm sure it isn't hurting that. Uh, we are truly in a place now, and, and those of you who are in the sourcing business, I'm sure will back me up, uh, that the traditional destination 
that we whichever one that we went to or I should even say traditional destinations are no longer as dominant nobody is doing the bulk of their sourcing from China as they would in the past or any other one place uh, uh, in fact you know the sort of trend there that began as sort of yeah we do everything in China to China plus one to then maybe China plus two is just even that is no longer the case China itself is plateauing uh, you know and I put a question mark next to that because of two reasons really one of them is uh, it's not really yet established that China is kind of plateaued we do have peaks and valleys uh, still with the uh, month-to-month uh, export data and sometimes it contracts sometimes it expands the overall trend does seem to be a flattening but the other reason that question mark is there is because even if China is indeed plateauing that is one hell of a high plateau you know the latest Otexa data still shows China accounting for a third uh, of apparel manufacturing uh, uh, certainly uh, imports into the US so um, it's definitely not going anywhere anytime soon Bangladesh the country that most benefited in the sort of recent past from China's uh, slowdown um, is still a player uh, but there are ongoing challenges there uh, of course everyone is aware of the uh, unfortunate industrial accidents that uh, marred Bangladesh's image uh, in late 2012 and through the middle of 2013 um, and they, they continue to um, as I said struggle with that um, they, their market the export market there has not been hit uh, anywhere near as hard as some uh, expected in the wake of Rana Plaza. Uh, but uh, the growth that they had been uh, getting accustomed to in the months leading up to that has not also maintained itself either. So the big, uh, bold ambition they uh, uh, announced you know, to get 50 billion by their 50th independence anniversary, 2021, uh, seems to be uh, a bit of a stretch at this point, although they do continue to still uh, be the second largest exporter of apparel in the world. Vietnam, in a sort of the current growth uh, uh, area, um, continues to grow despite the demise of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, I have long held that, um, and even in sort of the months when things weren't clear with regards to TPP, in the immediate wake of uh, President Trump's election, uh, I had long held that the fact that Vietnam had started to see serious investment, uh, whether or not it was in anticipation of TPP, uh, they had been seeing serious investment and they had been seeing serious investment in terms of going vertical, uh, had made it clear to me that um, the, the market was, was, was there and it was going to stay. Uh, people were investing and so perhaps the investment was being made in the hopes of a higher return come TPP, but there was obviously enough return there to justify the investment in the first place. So I was not at all surprised to see the growth continue in Vietnam, despite the demise of TPP, as I said, and I do believe it will continue to be the case. So another uh, uh, sort of addition to the fact that the traditional destinations are no longer dominant and we have another major player in the fold. India with the now no longer very new Prime Minister Narendra Modi and the modified era as they uh, uh, called it uh, now underway uh, the question is whether India will become an even bigger player in this sector in the apparel sector um, and there are signs to suggest that uh, they it will indeed certainly uh, everyone I'm speaking to over there is uh, quite impressed at the changes Modi has brought into the overall business climate uh, India has long since been infamous for red tape and bureaucracy and uh, there do seem to be some real attempts to cut through some of that um, and uh, if nothing else I think the signals that Modi has been able to send with regards to decisiveness and and you know the, the whole demonetization um, um, some would say I don't want to use the word fiasco but some would say you know ill-advised uh, but others would quite argue the opposite uh, eloquently uh, the point there being not so much whether the move was was a good one or not but that it was decisive it was executed you know with with absolutely no delay uh, and it wasn't as if there was any question as to who was in charge those kinds of signals are in the end net positive and I do believe 
purely from a sort of markets point of view and looking at the uh, the Bombay Sensex or other sort of Indian company listings, uh, there, there does seem to be a general uh, upswing in business climate in, in India. And while a lot of that is focused on other industries than ours, I do believe ours will also see some benefits from it. So again, another big player there. And finally, um, sort of to go to the other end of the spectrum, uh, and uh, very much in the mold of traditional sourcing destinations no longer being as dominant, uh, interest in Africa continues to increase. Uh, now, Africa is not one country, it's a massive continent, and there, there's, there's definitely areas where that interest is concentrated. Uh, East Africa, Ethiopia, Kenya, um, southern part of Africa uh, tend to be the, you know, Mauritius, Madagascar uh, in particular tend to be where you see most of the interest. Uh, but even within that sort of subset, uh, there is a question as to whether Africa can at any time soon deliver the volume um, uh, so that uh, most people uh, who study sourcing and the region uh, are of the opinion, and I agree with them, that uh, it will, at least for the foreseeable future, remain a interesting but relatively niche player uh, because they just don't have the capacity, both in terms of production and in terms of logistics, to get product out of the continent to replace the volume that folks who go to the Bangladeshs and the Chinas and the Vietnams of the world will need. There are other uh, uh, pockets of interest, uh, Myanmar, um, Cambodia, even Indonesia, uh, but broadly speaking I just wanted to highlight these and really make the point that traditional destinations are no longer as dominant as they used to be. Another big trend uh, in, that we're seeing in sourcing and has really you know, established itself now is a consolidation of vendor bases for many, especially the bigger retailers, um, uh, driven, I suppose, by two sort of major considerations. One is simply uh, a more refined sort of risk management approach that recognizes that, you know, as the old adage goes, 80% of your headaches come from 20% of your factories, so cut those out as best you can. Um, but also, as, as more and more um, uh, sourcing um, experts recognize the value of better longer-term relationships with their factories rather than just transactional short-term ones. You naturally see a whittling down to um, uh, folks that you've got positive experiences with and, and that trend as I said will continue with some notable exceptions. Uh, obviously folks in the fast fashion uh, business will of necessity still see higher churn and more transactional relationships, uh, and whereas folks with the more established, uh, less frenetic sourcing calendars will be better placed to cherry pick and, and, and consolidate their vendors and have a better uh, longer term thinking approach. Um, and another factor that is contributing to the consolidation of vendors, uh, and the main topic for us to speak about now, is that social compliance is now unquestionably a more important factor in decision making with regards to where one sources product from. Which brings us to the trends in social compliance. Um, let me broaden the lens here a little bit and look at the trends sort of from the birth of social compliance to today just to give you an overall picture of the evolution of social compliance over the past couple of decades. Uh, it began uh, quite simply, in a comply or die mold. Retailers and brands put together the codes of conduct and went to factories and said, you shall comply or you shall not do business with me. Um, and that had um, some unfortunate side effects, uh, not least of which is that it began this whole industry in a rather adversarial um, stature. Uh, and something that we continue to struggle with with regards to social audits, for example, still being seen as necessary evils and factories treating them as you know a cat and mouse game. But uh, over time, as folks who were uh, doing this uh, for a decade, decade and a half, started to realize that comply or die is not necessarily proving effective in moving the needle, 
the approach to compliance started to evolve more towards a continuous improvement methodology, which uh, recognized that you know simply insisting on compliance with hard and fast rules might not be very productive because factories are dynamic places with their own sets of challenges, and uh, you know ultimately they really might be inclined to work with you and do well, uh, but can't necessarily get there in one single stride. And so working together, giving the factories a chance to improve um, uh, was seen as the better path. And folks started to think about social compliance in that mold to more of an even advanced approach, which is a partnership engagement approach, where it's not simply that the buyer is going to be more patient with the factory and give them time to improve, but rather they will actually directly engage with the factory to help them improve um, and hopefully learn from the factory things that can then in turn help the buyer improve its own purchasing practices and better its own margins. Um, by recognizing that there is some uh, uh, potential for these buyers to have best practices they can share from others in their vendor base or from other experiences or from partnering with organizations uh, such as RAP or, or through information obtained from uh, trade uh, fora and uh, an associations such as the CAF. So the thinking is it's no longer simply just I'll be patient, you just continue to improve, but rather let's work together and get you to improve. So I've said all this as if it's one smooth evolutionary path that we've taken. Of course, that's not true at all. Different players are at different places today. Uh, and in fact, uh, however funny this may sound, I know of organizations that are actually in more than one of these places themselves, uh, you know, especially with regards to large entities uh, that might hold different brands under their umbrella and each brand may not necessarily be um, approaching compliance exactly the same way. Or even within a single brand, uh, a different approach might be taken to, say, the footwear division uh, as compared to the apparel division. So you will find out there folks that are still doing the comply or die, um, though that tends to be relatively rare these days. Most folks are probably going to be in the continuous improvement uh, bucket and uh, a handful of the more enlightened, the more, shall we say, advanced programs uh, are into the partnership engagement model. So. With that history as general background, um, what are the trends that we're seeing in social compliance? First and foremost, social compliance is moving mainstream. There is no question about this. Um, it is actually a very positive trend, uh, if you ask me. Um, and, and, and basically what I mean by that is that we're no longer in a space where social compliance is an afterthought, right? Uh, in the early stages, it would be factories would be evaluated on price, quality, and delivery, and oh, by the way, when you get around to it, let's also make sure that you're socially responsible. Uh, today, that's no longer the case for most serious uh, sourcing programs out there. Uh, it is very much part of the conversation. Social compliance is, is looked at in the same breath as price, quality, and delivery. Uh, very often, it is in fact actually even before you get to that discussion, so you are actually pre-qualifying factories has become a threshold requirement in order to do business. Um, and what that has meant is that uh, whereas in the past you would find social compliance kind of being a separate department, uh, really nowhere near the sourcing folks and not in any way associated with them, there is now a lot more internal cross-training, internal collaboration, social compliance people uh, are in sourcing teams or vice versa. Sourcing folks are being trained. One of the things that we do at RAP uh, for many stakeholder brands uh, is to educate their sourcing people, their QA people, about social compliance issues because those guys are in the factories far more often than the social auditors are and can therefore serve as a great early warning system, a wonderful set of eyes and ears on the ground while not themselves being social auditors if they are better attuned to social responsibility issues. You are also seeing, as a result of social compliance moving mainstream, a lot more resources being dedicated to social compliance and therefore enabling a lot more external collaboration with regards to brands and retailers working together uh, with each other. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those uh, initiatives uh, 
but also being able to engage more with organizations like RAP or other fora that can provide them with additional resources, best practices, guidance, and the like. So um, what was, I don't want to say an afterthought, but what was a, a department that was often the, you know, received the ugly stepsister treatment uh, is, is now really very much mainstream and part and parcel of the overall sourcing equation and the sourcing conversation. The other trend that also is now clearly established is that we're moving up the supply chain. Um, social compliance began and still to this day is largely concentrated on the first tier. Uh, but that's not the universal truth anymore. It's not just first tier suppliers. Many programs are moving to the second tier, to mills, to sundries, to accessories. Um, and we see that in terms of the kinds of facilities that we're getting through asking for RAP certification. Um, and the um, expectation is very much that this will continue to be the trend, driven both by a sense of um, there being risk beyond just the first tier, uh, uh, in part because you know traceability is now easier and while still nowhere near perfect, uh, brands and retailers do find themselves exposed to bad PR uh, when it comes to lo looking at conditions much deeper in their supply chain all the way down to raw materials. Um, you may very well remember and it's still an uh, ongoing situation with the rush to Uzbek cotton for example. So there is uh, a growing recognition that there is risk there and also because uh, uh, one of the drivers of social compliance moving mainstream is the recognition of the value it brings over and above simply risk mitigation, but just in the form of getting factories to be better factories, better, uh, more efficiently run, better at uh, uh, you know, delivering product to them because they are more efficiently run. And so the desire to drive that kind of um, business case past the first tier is also playing a role uh, with that trend. And finally, uh, another trend, uh, also quite clear, although perhaps not necessarily seen universally as a positive trend, is a real uptick in regulatory activity. Um, and this is not simply a case of um, uh, sort of local jurisdiction regulation. It's not just a case of a domestic you know, California Supply Chain Transparency Act that, you know, at least on paper, really only applies to entities doing business in California, but re regulation that actually has an international reach. Uh, you may quite be familiar with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act um, that has uh, international reach on, on for, with regards to U.S. entities, but an even better example is the U.K. Anti-Bribery Act, which uh, is not only applicable uh, on its face to U.K. entities seeking to bribe uh, or be bribed by foreign entities, but actually does have a long arm provision that in theory would enable it, them to go after the other party, the party that is attempting to bribe the UK entity uh, or is getting bribed by the UK entity. Uh, so there, are, there is serious activity in this regard. Um, some of you may have heard about the, the, the new or the draft French due diligence law that although uh, it's been watered down a little bit um, uh, in the latest version. The Dutch uh, recently passed one. There is one in consideration in the Netherlands and many other jurisdictions are looking at similar um, statutes that would regulate activity uh, tied to social compliance. And, and some of these tend to take the form of reporting requirements. So they're not so much telling you exactly what you need to do as simply asking you to report what you need to do. But even those inherently have a, an expectation tied to it. But more critically, as far as trends go, we're seeing the newer ones actually become prescriptive, actually saying what it is you need to do or what it is you cannot do uh, rather than simply be reporting. So a trend uh, of, of potential significance, certainly, for, for us. Other broad trends that I want to touch upon uh, with regards to the social compliance space is uh, an unquestionable increase in transparency. Some of this, uh, you know, while sounds positive and the industry 
should perhaps <laughs> applaud itself for, frankly, is, is forced. Uh, it's not so much increased transparency because uh, we, as players in the supply chain, have reached the enlightened conclusion that this is a good thing, but it has been forced upon us, uh, partly uh, because of the ubiquity of social media, as I said. You know, transparency is going to happen to you. It's just a question of whether you will be ready for it or if you will, you know, uh, be, be the one controlling the message or you will let others control the message for you. But also partly, uh, again, because of the perceived uh, positive spin you can place on it and the perceived positive uh, uh, reception it would get for you to be able to uh, um, get ahead of that and, and be transparent. And finally, I think because of the good work, the really good work that is being done out there by so many organizations in this space, they are feeling that there actually is you know, a legitimate case to be made for truly good stories to be told. And they, they're getting out there. We're starting to hear some of them. And that, I think, is certainly a positive thing because uh, I always say, that, you know, for all the um, negative public publicity that this industry gets, uh, I have long maintained that it is unquestionably an overall force for good. Um, and uh, by virtue of being such a labor-intensive industry and such a great source of jobs in countries that are such desperate need of them, uh, this this industry truly has helped create uh, economic mobility for millions of people around the world. Um, and no one actually tells that side of the story. Uh, and it is important that, that that side be heard as well. So it is good to see that increased transparency where it is a case of uh, brands and retailers and other players telling their story, telling of the good that they do. Um, I touched upon this other trend already, definitely much more increased engagement with the supply chain, uh, not just with regards to the overall trend moving from, you know, a um, adversarial comply or die to a more relationship-based continuous improvement to a partnership engagement, but even beyond that, uh, you're seeing uh, a, a more robust flow of communication from uh, vendor bases to uh, their buyers and, and vice versa. Um, it is maturing for sure and, and uh, it is also resulting in other players being brought into the conversation uh, such that programs like RAP, for example, that in the past would either be talking to the brand or the factory at uh, any point in time are now actually talking to both together. Uh, if that makes sense. It's not simply a conversation on one end of the supply chain or the other, but rather a holistic conversation altogether that is therefore much more productive. We're also seeing uh, a, a nice positive increase in collaboration, especially within trusted relationships. I'll talk, as I said, in just a minute about some of these uh, initiatives to harmonize, to collaborate. Uh, we're seeing better forward momentum uh, for these and certainly seeing more of these certainly at the micro level, uh, brands that have now been working together for a decade, decade and a half, and have therefore been able to build up some trust, are, they, are therefore able to have conversations, able to share information today that they weren't able to 10 years ago, uh, because they simply did not have that trust built up yet, because they had not had the time to do so. So that is a positive trend for sure in my books, um, and one that I expect will continue, um, as consolidation with vendors bases also goes up and you're therefore now even more likely to be working with the same factories that your peers are in and therefore can have more chances to build trusted relationships and collaborate based upon them. Um, and finally, uh, a trend that is true for social compliance as it is for pretty much everything else in our lives, uh, an increasing role for technology to play. Um, and this technology is really a catch-all for a variety of different uh, uh, innovative tools out there uh, to gather information, um, to uh, quickly share that information, to analyze that information. Uh, so many platforms are available today that weren't three or four years ago, let alone you know, five to ten years ago, that better enable uh, the swift sharing, uh, the, the better validation, and uh, the sort of more real-timeness of information that therefore enables better decision-making with regards to social compliance issues and sourcing issues as well. Right, so 
Moving on really quickly to a few current hot topics. Uh, those were the broad trends, and, and these topics uh, you know, are, are what's sort of on everyone's mind these days in the social compliance space. Uh, chief among them right now is, uh, is human trafficking. Uh, as really a subtopic within a larger discussion of forced labor issues. From Brussels, I will be heading over the weekend to Berlin to attend a couple of conferences put together jointly by the International Human Rights uh, Bureau and the uh, Consumer Goods Forum here in Europe. Uh, and the chief topic, probably the sole topic, is going to be forced labor um, and the increased attention that this is uh, necessitating with regards to supply chains that are particularly vulnerable to migrant labor as a major form of the uh, worker base. Um, you can, uh, I suppose, quickly grasp what some of these issues might be uh, with regards to freedom of movement of these migrants, with regards to uh, retention of their documents, uh, with regards to possibly uh, bonded labor issues uh, in terms of the vast amounts of money they have to raise in order to even get the job in the first place. Um, and it's a very complicated uh, uh, space because uh, it might not be sufficient, it might not be possible to get clarity on it simply by looking at the activities and the decisions of the factory that's hiring them because there are labor brokers and agents involved, there's the host and the home governments involved, so it's a very complicated space and one that uh, uh, is front and center these days in terms of attention being paid to it by the larger civil society sector, um, social responsible investment community, and of course NGOs out there. So very much a, a hot topic out there right now. The issue of working hours continues to be a hot topic, certainly not a new one, uh, one that has been plaguing this industry since the very beginning, I would say. Uh, uh, but it's now being sort of re-examined in light of the greater transparency that we talked about as a trend earlier. Um, and uh, it is marrying nicely with the evolution in thought uh, away from comply or die and towards continuous improvement and partnership. Um, and in this regard, RAP uh, took a bold decision last year, uh, and we're the only certification program in our space that's doing this right now, to institutionalize this uh, new approach by saying that uh, we will uh, continue to work with factories and we will certify facilities uh, that may not yet be in full compliance with their working hour requirements of the country they're in as long as they meet certain conditions, chief among them being that they be transparent with us about what those hours really are and that those hours be worked uh, voluntarily, safely, and be paid for properly. If these conditions are met, then we will work with the factory to establish a long-term working hours action plan uh, to drive uh, continuous improvement um, and not simply bar them from certification. So uh, a, a not new topic, but one that has become hot again uh, with that context in mind, yes, working hours issue. And finally, wages. Um, again, not a new topic uh, and, and uh, one that certainly continues to be front and central with regards to any kind of social compliance program. But what is interesting about uh, the, the sort of current level of uh, hotness is probably not a good word to use here, but the current level of interest in wages is that um, there is now greater involvement uh, uh, on the part of the buying community with uh, national minimum wage setting processes, uh, whether it's through buyers collectively via trade associations or directly you know, appealing to governments to formalize such institutions. Um, or uh, um, encourage the establishment of um, forums that would enable these discussions. I'm thinking, for example, of Cambodia, where a lot of activity took place around this and has had uh, a positive effect overall in terms of institutionalizing an annual review of uh, minimum wage. Uh, Bangladesh has had similar activity in this regard as well. So it's interesting to see the, um, the sort of movement there from, a, from being a topic that the brands and retailers really did not touch uh, until recently to being one where they are feeling the need to engage more, uh, not so much directly with the factories themselves saying, you know, you shall pay this or that, but rather with the whatever national minimum wage setting process is in place. So 
uh, how are brands and retailers reacting to all these trends um, and what are some of the uh, activities we're seeing in this regard well we are uh, fortunate that uh, you know as I mentioned with regards to collaboration and stuff that one positive reaction is that they're looking for partners they are demonstrating uh, a clear understanding that doing it all on their own is not going to be uh, you know possible or for that matter desirable um, certainly a, a big trend with regards to less reliance on own programs uh, a very good example of this uh, publicly known for a few months now is Walmart's announcement that they will be moving away from doing their own responsible sourcing audits to accepting uh, audits from third parties uh, they've selected eight organizations that they they will accept from and, and rap is, is one of them uh, so uh, you know a big uh, indicator and uh, uh, as I said um, validator of this trend for less reliance on own programs um, and you're seeing as I alluded to a couple of times uh, more activity on the harmonization standardization front uh, seeing some new efforts uh, and 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 these efforts are I should choose my words carefully here more enlightened efforts as well I would say because uh, past efforts at trying to come up with universal codes have all failed and they're all really doomed to fail because while the theory is that you know 90% of what we do is the same and so why can't we just agree on a code for all of us to use it is a sound theory the problem is that even if 90% of the questions I ask are the same as the ones you're asking the f challenge is that that 10% that are not are value-based distinctions that are questions that I ask because they're important to me or that you ask because they have value to you and while it is perfectly reasonable to expect universal agreement on neutral topics there's absolutely no way to get universal agreement on values so any attempt at trying to come to a universal code uh, I've now long maintained is, is doomed to fail and so uh, the smarter approach would be not to try to do that but rather to try to harmonize where you can and to standardize practices around codes that might not uh, shall we say encroach upon the values issue uh, now, the other reason why we're seeing more life and energy in harmonization and standardization efforts is because uh, in the wake of Rana Plaza, you know, one silver lining in that very dark cloud was that it brought forth two harmonization and standardization efforts that have proven successful, and I'm referring to the Alliance and the Accord, uh, which I expect you're, you're very familiar with. I'm happy to talk about them if you would like further. Uh, I'm actually on the board of advisors for the Alliance myself, uh, so let me know if you need to know anything more about these. But because they're out there, because they've been successful, it has enabled others to say, you know, these unprecedented efforts have proven that they can get things done, so let's, uh, let's give some other things a try. And uh, one of the big ones out there right now is something called the Social and Labor Convergence Project, which RAP is very closely involved in. In fact, my colleague Clay, who introduced me, who happens to be our vice president for strategy and business development is on the steering committee of this project which is a true example of trying to learn from the past mistakes of the harmonization efforts that we're trying to go for a, a universal code and not trying to do that instead trying to say can we come up with a universal audit report template a code agnostic data driven information gathering tool that simply standardizes the questionnaire which gathers the information and then everybody can make their own decisions based on their own values off of the information that that um, questionnaire uh, gives us. We're also seeing uh, the audit industry itself uh, attempting to harmonize and, and, and standardize a few things and most, most importantly about them is coming up with a professionalized a, a body of, of, of uh, you know, sort of authority that will professionalize the execution of social audits themselves. Right now, anyone can be a social auditor. Uh, there is no set requirements for it, no path to attaining that qualification, so to speak. It is truly an activity in, in, the, in the real sense of the word and not a profession in the likes of you know, doctors and lawyers that have their associations or the bar to regulate them. And so we have now a, a nascent body known as APSCA, the Association of Professional Social Compliance Auditors, that has just uh, gotten uh, up and running and 
I happen to have the honour of serving as the chairman of the board for APSCA, and before arriving in Brussels, I was in London earlier this week at a board meeting for APSCA. Uh, we should be seeing uh, a couple of foundational documents, the, the sort of principles of the Code of Professional Conduct and the competency framework for social auditors going out to public comment by the end of this month or early next, and I would uh, keep an eye out for those. So that's sort of the broad range of, of, of trends and hot topics and how brands are reacting to it. Let me spend a minute uh, talking very broadly about some responsible sourcing best practices before I close up and save uh, about 10 minutes for questions, if there are any. Um, the real lesson and the real true best practice out there is the recognition that auditing alone is not enough. There is no way that you are going to advance the cause if you consider social compliance to be simply a one-way street where you, the buyer, audit them, the producers. Uh, social compliance is unquestionably a two-way street and it, it necessarily means engagement must be had at all levels, which means that the buyers and the sellers in this equation have to understand the practical challenges that the other side faces. Factories are dynamic businesses with their own challenges and, and, and responsibilities, and brands and retailers, of course, have their own sets of issues and reputational risks and other kinds of things they have to manage. So it is necessary to understand this and to be consistent with the message that each side is sending to the other, and from the point of view of the brands and the retailers, this boils down most certainly to making sure there's no disconnect between sourcing and compliance. In the past, this was a a major source of frustration and certainly one of my pet peeves uh, with with the whole sourcing process in, in that compliance would go in and tell the factory one thing and sourcing would go in and say something else um, and you know who wrote the checks it was sourcing so you know they would be the ones the factory would listen to um, we've come a long way since then and as I said uh, we're seeing many more instances of sourcing and compliance now talking to each other within the brand or the retailer uh, but uh, that, that consistency with message is key, and we cannot allow any disconnect between those two. It comes down in the end to building partnerships, building partnerships within the uh, buying entity, within their sourcing and, and compliance teams, building partnerships between the, uh, the, the buyers and the manufacturers, and also layering onto that partnerships with organizations that provide guidance and support uh, whether it's the likes of RAP as a social compliance management expert or a uh, trade association like CAF that provides its own guidance and advice to, to their members. Um, ultimately, we want everyone to be in that continuous improvement space. Final point before I conclude. All of this means ongoing training and education become that much more important. And so I would like to thank all of you for taking the time to be involved with one such training and education effort and keeping yourself updated as to social compliance trends. To conclude, today's apparel supply chain is as fragmented and complex as it's ever been, and it continues to be worldwide. So there is really no way to uh, 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 approach this other than to be aware of the complexity and the broad range of issues that you need to deal with and do so in light of the ubiquity of social media and the fact that we live in a world of 24-7 global communication, which means any event, whether it's in China or Bangladesh or anywhere else, can appear on CNN or BBC within minutes uh, or at most hours. And if it's bad news, it'll be minutes, not hours, believe me. All this means that reputation and supply chain management are now more global and more high stakes issues than they've ever been. And that, in turn, means the need for constant education to ensure you stay abreast of the latest trends, which now you can say you are after having attended this webinar.